Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! You are listening to LBC, for which, as ever, I thank you. Nothing easy about the conversation we're about to have. It is, I think it's fair to say, that few stories have galvanised the British public more this year than the so-called VIP paedophile scandal. And one of the strangest elements to me has been the sceptical wing, if you like, the people who feel that because Jimmy Savile is dead, the uh, rush to justice undertaken by many victims of child abuse after he died has been uh, undesirable. It's been unedifying. I think it's been... Well, the closest thing to a silver lining you'll ever find in such an ugly cloud, that the post-Savile environment has been one in which, well, victims are more empowered to come forward. And, and yet I still open my newspaper every day to read various columnists, some f for whom I have respect, others for whom I have none, writing things like, and Jimmy Savile is still dead. There's a sort of s suspicion, if you like, of people coming forward to allege abuse, which isn't helped, of course, when some of the cases fail. And some of the decisions taken by the CPS have clearly been ill-advised. But, <sighs> Greville Janna, the, the, uh, you have to remember the astonishing element of the Lord Janna case was the decision by the CPS to detail the exact charges he would have faced if he had been deemed well enough. He was considered too... Uh, he was suffering from dementia to such a degree that he was considered unable to face trial himself. But the CPS actually catalogued and detailed, it's not proof of guilt, um, 22 offences alleged to have taken place in a 20-year period involving nine different children and young adults, all cared for in children's homes. These ranged from indecent assaults to the crime... Um, as it was on the statute books then, of buggery. What's more, um, it was admitted that Jana should have been charged in 1991 and that there were two further missed opportunities in 2002 and 2007 when the evidential test was passed and yet no action was taken. If the evidential test was passed, that means the CPS considered there would be, this is the words of Alison Saunders, the Director of Public Prosecutions, there would have been a realistic prospect of, convention, of, of conviction. And former Labour peer Lord Janner, who was accused of 22 counts of historical sex abuse, has died at the age of 87. He had been suffering from dementia. Greville Janner's family deny all the allegations against him. Our Home Affairs correspondent Darshan Soni has been speaking to one of his alleged victims. Paul Miller was just a schoolboy when he claims he was abused by Lord Janner in the House of Commons. For years, he thought nobody would believe him. Nobody would believe my word against powerful, well-known man like him, and now that's gone. After years of delays, Mr Miller had been hoping that the trial of facts scheduled for April would have allowed him his day in court. But with the peer's death, Mr Miller has had to accept that it won't now go ahead. I think that's what they were waiting for, basically. You know, they've, they've fudged the issue, uh, they've dragged the feet, the CPS were that long, and this is the outcome. Lord Janner served as an MP in Leicester for nearly three decades, until he was made a life peer in 1997. He was a leading campaigner for Israeli and Jewish causes, and also set up a parliamentary war crimes commission to bring ex-Nazis living in Britain to justice. But Lord Janner's achievements came to be overshadowed by the allegations of child sex abuse. He was well known and well connected here in Leicester and, rightly or wrongly, many believe that's why he was never made to face a court of law. Allegations first emerged publicly in October 1991 at the trial of a former children's home boss, Frank Beck. Beck was convicted. Greville Janner was interviewed by police, investigated but not charged. He used parliamentary privilege to issue a strong denial. There was, of course, not a shred of truth in any of the allegations of criminal conduct made against me. Further police investigations occurred in 2002 and again in 2006, but no charges were brought. In 2009, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Four years later, Leicestershire police raided his London home and his House of Lords office. 
In April this year, the Director of Public Prosecutions made the controversial decision not to prosecute Lord Janna because his dementia made him unfit to stand trial. But in June, that decision was overturned and a trial of the facts was to have taken place. However, Lord Janna would still not have faced a criminal trial in person because a High Court judge recently ruled he was too ill. Some of his alleged victims still want a trial of the facts to go ahead and may still pursue civil claims. Obviously, it will be difficult because Janna is now dead, but it, it's still possible to continue with those claims and, frankly, that's probably their only hope of justice. Lord Janna always strongly denied the allegations and his family have described him as a man of integrity who will be greatly missed. But for his alleged victims, Lord Janna's death has once again left them feeling cheated of a chance at justice. From what I've read, they had evidence to go on in 91. So what I want to know is why they didn't. The police and the CPS say they regret not doing it. It was, it was well then. So why was no action taken? So I am going to nudge you now towards my position, which is that the Greville Janna case is so, so uh, specific that you can actually sit here and say there is nothing odd, weird or wrong about the notion of effectively putting a dead man on trial. And the reason I say that is precisely because a decision had been taken that it was reasonable to have a trial of the facts while he was, to all intents and purposes, and I, I'm going to use quite a grim phrase here, and I, don't, and I know that it is an unpleasant one, but I'm going to say he was intellectually dead as a description of the mental state he was in that led the court to conclude that he couldn't face trial himself. He was still physically alive, but mentally he was no longer there on a sufficient scale to merit a trial. So my position is this. If you can have a trial of the facts with someone who is intellectually absent, then you can have a trial of the facts with someone who is physically absent. Because a trial of the facts is not about delivering justice to the alleged perpetrator. It's about providing some form of justice to the accuser, to have their day in court. However, even as I speak at seven minutes after 12, I'm conscious that that sounds a bit bonkers putting a dead man on trial. When the Russians did it to Sergei Magnitsky, the lawyer who's um, uh, uh, killers were effectively the same people who'd stolen the 200 million pounds of tax money that he was investigating the disappearance of when he died in jail and the Kremlin subsequently put him on posthumous trial for fraud. I thought that was about the most telling illustration of just how rancid and corrupt Vladimir Putin's Kremlin is that we in the West had encountered. Um, that, of course, was before they sent KGB goons to London to kill Alexander Litvinenko, a crime that remains utterly and completely unpunished. We digress slightly. I mentioned Sergei Magnitsky because the notion of putting a dead man on trial struck me then and strikes me now as ridiculous. But it doesn't in the case of Greville Janna. And the reason for that is, as I've just explained, if you can put him on trial when he's not there mentally, why not afford his victims the same opportunity for him to be put on trial when he's not there physically? I'm going to open up the phone lines now. That's all I've got, to be honest with you. That is the conversation we're having. The CPS has indicated that it is still considering putting uh, uh, the trial of facts ahead, letting the trial of facts go ahead. Um, the former Director of Public Prosecutions, Lord MacDonald, said yesterday, it's quite finely balanced. It's a difficult decision again for the Director of Public Prosecutions, and I don't envy her. This is Lord MacDonald speaking yesterday. He also used the word unseemly to describe the whole thing, suggested that there might be something unseemly about a dead man being tried in any way. Lord Janna, who died on Saturday, had been charged with 22 sexual offences dating back to the 1960s, most of them against children. You'll remember the Director of Public Prosecutions had ruled that he could not be put on trial because he had Alzheimer's, a decision that was then overturned. He was to have faced a trial of the facts which would have allowed the alleged victims to have their day in court, even if a guilty verdict wouldn't have resulted uh, in any punishment. Indeed, there wouldn't have been such a verdict. It was simply the facts, and uh, uh, Lord Janner himself would not have been required to attend. Still, um, that was hugely important, the prospect of that trial. Uh, here's one man who wants to remain anonymous, who uh, has claimed that the Labour peer abused him at a working man's club. I feel very let down because we can't have our say in court and 
it will be now known as oh well no it might not even have happened uh, we've not got justice let us talk to uh, Ken McDonnell, Lord McDonnell, former Director of Public Prosecutions, and then we'll hear in a few moments' time from Liz Duck, specialist uh, uh, who in these matters from Slater and Gordon, the solicitor's firm, who actually represents six of the alleged victims. Lord McDonnell, first of all, good morning to you. Good morning. Um, is that it? Can the trial of the facts now not go ahead? Well, when a defendant dies, it's conventional for criminal proceedings to be discontinued because the whole purpose of the proceedings is firstly to determine whether the defendant's guilty or not guilty and if he's guilty to apply penal sanction um, and both of these outcomes obviously require the presence of a defendant to take part to challenge the prosecution to put his own case and so on and if necessary to be punished the whole point of a trial of the facts on the other hand is that it doesn't exist to determine the guilt uh, or innocence of anyone there's no question of a penal sanction at its conclusion so it doesn't um, I suppose require the presence of the defendant in fact it only takes place when the defendant is incapable of taking part as Lord Janna unfortunately was um, uh, on the other hand, it could be argued that the defendant is still an important participant in the process because at its conclusion, the court uh, is still required to consider whether to apply a hospital order, a supervision order, mm. or a discharge, and this presupposes that the defendant uh, is still alive. G given how important this is to so many people, though, which way would you lean on the balance of those arguments? Well, it's, it's actually quite finely balanced. I mean, I think, and, and it's a difficult decision yet again for the uh, DPP, and I don't envy her, but in the end, I think there's something unseemly about a criminal process to determine the acts of a person who um, has already died. That would be a groundbreaking proceedings, and I uh, proceeding, and I think probably groundbreaking in an unfortunate way. I mean, well, he wasn't going to be there, was he? Well, he wasn't going to be there, but so never no, 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 it doesn't make any difference at all, does it, it, to the actual proceedings of the trial? Except that counsel is appointed by the court to represent um, his interests, so there is some um, process uh, within the trial of the facts outside uh, the the uh, presentation of evidence um, by the prosecution. I mean, we've always um, in, in this country regarded the presence or potential presence of a defendant as being intrinsic uh, to criminal proceedings. I'm not pretending that this is an easy decision. I think on balance I would probably say that the death of Lord Janner is a time to draw uh, a line but under Interesting. This. People will be interested though that you're saying on balance. In, in other words, there is the prospect uh, in law and you think if the DPP um, intervened uh, along these lines, it would be possible at least to continue and to hold the trial of facts. That is not something that is simply inconceivable. I think you could make an argument, but you'd have to acknowledge that part of this process is a culmination of the proceedings in which the court is required to consider uh, a, a, some form of disposal, whether it's a hospital order, a discharge, or a supervision order, and none of those is possible, obviously, in the case of a man who has unfortunately died, and that may call into question the whole purpose and legal justification for the proceedings. I mean, that's the argument mm. against continuing. The argument for continuing, as you say, is that he was not going to play any part in these proceedings in any event, even if he had not uh, unfortunately died. Could you stay on the line, Lord McDonald? We've got Liz Ducks here, as I was saying, represents six of the alleged uh, victims. What, if there is a possibility, just a possibility, that the trial of the facts could go ahead, you presumably and the people you represent would hugely welcome it? Oh, certainly. I mean, I think they're under the impression that that wasn't now a possibility. Uh, and don't forget, these are people who gave, many of them gave their testimony decades ago, who've had many opportunities to bring him to justice uh, when he was alive and, and well, thwarted. And now to have the opportunity, all they want is their evidence to be tested uh, in a court, uh, to be cross-examined and for facts to be established. And for that to have been pulled from them at the 11th hour was devastating. Why could can't they simply do that, though, in the inquiry, the overarching inquiry that we know is, is getting underway and where they will have an opportunity, presumably, and this will uh, be a one... Uh, set of the many things that, that is looked at. Well, that's right. I mean, Lady Justice Goddard has already announced that Westminster will form an important part, and I'm sure that Lord Janna's case would fall into that category. And, um, you know, we are thinking that the Goddard inquiry will now take on huge importance for my clients. It's not the same, though, as giving their evidence in a criminal court, and that evidence being cross-examined and tested and a court making findings of facts. But Goddard will be of huge importance to them but I mean if she did it, if she was able to provide uh, a, a context where the things that they were said were 
tested to the best of her ability to provide that. But I'm just wondering actually whether in, in essence it's not going to be very different, is it, to a court? It, it, it will take on massive significance. The, the point about this trial was going to be that there were so many witnesses, over a hundred I believe, who were going to give evidence who weren't alleged victims but were going to give corroborative evidence uh, about the allegations that were made. Whether those uh, witnesses will now have the opportunity to attend and give evidence, which was very, very significant to my clients. Yeah, would, uh, Lord MacDonald, would that be something now, do you think uh, Lord Justice Goddard will be able to organise herself, and particularly with respect to, to um, uh, Greville Janna, that in, in a way that looks and feels and is, to all intents and purposes, a kind of replication of the procedure that we were going to have with this trial? Well, I think she'll be freer to do that than a trial of the facts would be, because a trial of a f the, the trial of the facts couldn't go into Lord Janna's culpability for whichever acts were found to have taken place, whereas uh, this inquiry will be entitled to look into everything, including his culpability. So in some respects, it will be a fuller proceeding uh, and a proceeding more likely to, del to deliver full justice than a trial of the facts would be. And I, and I suspect, I suspect that's what's going to happen. That, that, that's a very important point and, and, and that's really what they want. The, the main concern, and, and, and I have absolute confidence that Lady God Justice Goddard will do this uh, in, in a very great detail, but of course, the worry is about the time that this will take. You know, this was due to be heard in April. What they don't want to see happen is to wait five years to have the opportunity um, to, to have their say. Um, and I would urge the inquiry now to progress this part of the investigation as quickly as possible. Liz Ducks and Lord MacDonald as well. Thanks both very much. There's an interesting article in The Telegraph today that, that, that left me a little bit close. I'm a great admirer of the journalist Dan Hodges. Uh, I appreciate he's very divisive, but I think some of the best um, common commenters, some of the best journalists who, who deal in opinion are very, very divisive. You kind of have to be. This, to me, seems to be almost entirely devoid of any understanding of, of or empathy for victims and accusers, victims and or accusers. It seems to me to be that a trial of the facts would be about helping them rather than necessarily seeking to secure any punishment for the offender. You know that in a trial of the, f the facts, if a guilty verdict is delivered, you know that the offender will not be punished in any way. If Greville Janner had been alive, the trial of facts had gone ahead and the court effectively believed the testimony of his accusers, nothing would have happened to Greville Janner. All that would have been traduced is his reputation. And that can still happen if he's dead. Just in this case, because the wheels of justice have, have turned so far on this specific issue with so many men. You know, one of them says he's got letters, love letters, that Jana sent him when he was a little boy. Still got them. That's why in 2002 and 2007, Alison Saunders has said he should have been put on trial. I still don't know why he wasn't. That's the sort of question that could get asked in a trial of the facts. And yet, there's something, as Lord MacDonald said yesterday, I feel unseemly as I say that. 03456060973 is the number you need. Can you make an exception to the general rule that putting dead men on trial is ridiculous in the case of Lord Janna, as I am somewhat clumsily trying to do? You can email james at lbc.co.uk and you can text me on 84850. You can tweet as well, of course you can, at Mr. James OB. I want to see him. Or rather, I want to see the trial of facts go ahead because I want to hear his accusers' voices. And I want them to have their day in court. And if you have been told that there was enough evidence to prosecute in 1991, in 2002, and in 2007, but no prosecution was brought, how do you ever achieve anything that remotely resembles remotely resembles closure or comfort if you know that the truth has never been told. Your truth has never been told. But even as I speak, you can tell because I keep tying myself in knots, even as I speak I'm very conscious of how daft it might sound to suggest that a dead man could be examined by a court in any meaningful way. <clears throat> Hit the numbers now, you will get through. I need your help with this one as well, because as I say, we, we haven't, I'll tell you what, considering we're nearing the end of term, we're not making life very easy for ourselves with our choice of subjects at the moment. Some of the most difficult questions I've ever asked you over the last few shows, and this is very much on that page. Is it to you reasonable that a trial of the facts regarding the allegations made against Lord Janna by nine separate individuals, the trial of the facts goes ahead even though he's dead? Yes or no? And then, of course, as ever on this programme, I will want the why. John's in Hailsham. John, what would you like to say? 
Hello there, James. I just feel that if there is any justice in this country, Lord Jenner should still uh, have a trial against him in his absence because obviously there is overwhelming evidence at this point. And what I find actually amazing is that his own close-knit family are all standing in total denial of any guilt of this man, aren't they? Well, so would you, I think, if, if someone you loved stood accused of heinous crimes. I, I don't want to move too far away from the central question of a, of a trial of facts for a man who's dead. Even as I say those words to you, it doesn't, it doesn't sound silly. No, I appreciate what you're saying, James. I mean, obviously, if there was, if there was any kind of doubt... But what would be achieved by it? Well, I think, obviously, the victims do feel aggrieved what's happened to them. And I think, obviously, there's a lot of uh, people in power, shall we say, that have been abused in their positions. Obviously, this Lord Jenner, obviously, was abused in his power. And, you know, the little... Well, uh, you, can't, you, can't, you can't libel the dead, obviously, but I would, I would remind you that the, 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 the situation is allegations and accusations. There is no conviction and there is no... No proof. The trial of the facts might provide that one way or the other. You obviously lean very heavily towards the view that it would provide proof that he was, uh, that he did abuse these boys. What would that achieve, even if that proof was delivered by a trial of the facts? What would it change? How would the world look different? Well, I just feel that if no trial takes place at all, then there clearly can be no justice against any victims who feel aggrieved. But why, why is he different? Why not then put every dead man? We could put people who've been dead for 150 years on trial. Well, I suppose we could, but I suppose it's quite an emotional uh, issue. Well, you don't want emotion in justice. Justice has to be devoid of emotion. So, in a way, you're arguing against yourself now. What is it about this case that you feel merits this sort of special exclusion, if you like? Well, I, I just feel that it is an emotional issue. More, more, the, the emotional issue against paedophilia is obviously is an emotional issue with people, more so than perhaps the other crimes that might take place, you know, and I think, you know... Why don't we have a trial of the facts with Jimmy Savile as well, then? Well, but, but we could well do, but I mean, at the end of the day, no one really doubts for one minute that Jimmy Savile was obviously a very unsavoury character, do not they? I mean, if we had a trial against Jimmy Savile, it wouldn't make any difference. People know what the man was up to. Um, but obviously in this Jenner's case, there is, there probably is some doubt, maybe. Do you know what I'm hearing? Do you know what I'm hearing? You, you think he's guilty, which is your prerogative. Well, yeah. And therefore you don't think he should be able to rest in peace, as it were. Well, I think the only way he can rest in peace and the only way the victims can get justice is if we do have some form of trial to try and bring the facts to and light. And if, if you were a defender of, of Greville Janney, you mentioned family members who've insisted throughout that he was innocent of all the accusations against him, wouldn't you relish the chance to prove it as well? Well, I certainly would. If it was my father or my brother that was involved in this, obviously you want to walk through society with your head held high. It'd be nice to perhaps have it proved one way or the other. I, I would have thought so. I, I, I would have thought so. I don't, I don't want to be completely glib on the sort of nothing to hide, nothing to fear school of thought. But if on one side you've got people who are absolutely, and there's a lot of them, absolutely adamant that Greville Jenner abused them, on the other side you've got a family that is absolutely adamant that he didn't, even posthumously a trial of the facts could be seen as serving both of their purposes, depending on which way it goes. At least there would be a conclusion, if you like. And yet, look, I, I, here I am, on a, on a Tuesday afternoon, sitting here in front of my microphone saying, yes, I am in favour of effectively, uh, not, not literally, but effectively putting a dead man on trial. And if you'd said to me a couple of years ago, before this particular saga started unfolding, the, the broader story of the whole of the VIP abuse scandal. If you said to me a couple of years ago, do you know what you're going to be doing, James? I'll tell you what you'll be doing on uh, December the 22nd, 2015. You'll be doing your thing, you'll be banging your drum, you'll be up on your soapbox, and you'll be trying to tell Britain that a dead man should be put on trial. I would have laughed in your face. I would have absolutely... Yeah, of course I will. Of course I will. And I'll, I'll go home on a flying elephant. But here I am, telling you. I think a dead man should be put on trial. Paul in Guildford writes, digging up dead men to put them on trial is ludicrous and it will open up a can of worms. Who should we dig up next? Calling it a trial is the problem. Having an inquiry is not a problem. Well, call it what it is, Paul, and it should settle some of your conniptions. Call it a trial of the facts as opposed to the trial of the man. And why would having a trial of the facts with a man who is physically uh, absent uh, through death be any different from having a trial of the facts 
with a man who is mentally absent through dementia. I, I, you, need, you need to nail that for me. You can say that we shouldn't have had a trial of the facts at all with the dementia angle, but you need to explain to me how being physically absent is any different from being mentally absent if you want to explain why there shouldn't be a trial of the facts regarding Greville Janner. 0345 6060973 is the number you need. I, I, I love these sort of subjects, the ones where I'm pretty, pretty persuaded by my own position but I wonder that I can't back it up intellectually. Because then I, I sort of set myself the challenge of backing it up over the course of the hour. I, I, it feels to me absolutely rotten to suggest that these nine accusers should not have a chance to tell their stories. But you know how we normally feel about feelings on this program, especially when they come up against facts. So the fact is that a trial of the facts was going to happen. He wouldn't have been there, physically or mentally. Now he's dead. What's actually changed? Duncan's in Acton. Duncan, what would you like to say? Hi, James. I don't, I don't think it's daft at all. I oh, think good. you're absolutely right. Um, there have been countless cases where people have been posthumously pardoned for things that they haven't done. I don't see that there's any, different in fi any difference in finding someone guilty for what they have. It's really strange. Oh, and that's a fascinating it's... angle. I said one thinks, I think of Alan Turing most obviously. Didn't he get a posthumous well, yeah. pardon relatively recently, even though he's long perfect, been dead? Perfect example. Perfect example. And there's something else here as well. If there is nothing to hide, I'm not sure why there is such reluctance to bring the evidence to the forefront and find out. You know, it's something strange about trials where people are so desperate to, to keep things under wraps. If there is nothing rancid, then surely a trial of facts would be better because then Lord Janna's reputation can be untarnished. Yes, you know, it can be rehabilitated. Exactly. So, well, that, that is, I, I mean, it sounded mischievous when, when I first posited it with, a, with an earlier caller, but, but uh, because he'd, he'd mentioned the family who, who, who continue to insist upon uh, their father or their grandfather's innocence. And, and you would say, mm -hmm. well, if, if, you know, this isn't uh, being cheeky or mischievous, that, then you've got a chance as well to, to, to unsmirch exactly. his reputation. It's completely two-sided, isn't it? I would have thought so, unless we're both mm -hmm. missing something. And in, in answer to your question about, about the whys and the wherefores of it, if, as we know, as far ago as 1991, during the trial of a notorious paedophile called Frank Beck, um, uh, uh, there was evidence that Janna had a case to answer that never, ever, ever got put to him, then mm. there must have been cover-ups subsequently. So there must be reasons why people don't want anything to go ahead that involve perhaps other uh, offences being committed by other people. How, how, he, how he never came to court, despite these three separate occasions when he was found to have passed the evidential test, will involve a lot more people than just Lord Janna. Mm. Mm. Well, and, and also, I don't, I don't know whether this is a little bit dodgy to say, but... Um, I'm not completely convinced by his mental state. If he was well enough so recently before he actually retired from the House of Lords to go in, I mean, he was already claiming, or people were already claiming, that he wasn't well enough to stand trial, and yet he was going into the House of Lords. During that period. The, 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 during that period. You're right. His attendance at the House of Lords occurred subsequent to his diagnosis, but we'll never know. And, and, and you're perfectly entitled to say that. You're perfectly entitled to be suspicious and, and indeed to be sceptical, especially against the backdrop of such confusing apparent cover-up. It was the Deputy Chief Constable? Assistant Assistant Chief Constable of Leicestershire, who said in April, um, there is cre credible evidence that this man carried out some of the most serious sex crimes imaginable over three decades against children who were highly vulnerable and the majority of whom were in care. But you've got to park your feelings, leave your feelings at the door, focus on the fact. All right, I will focus on the fact. Let's have a trial of them. I'm not seeing any flaws in this position yet, but I'm sure you'll find some. Ronnie's in Finchley. Ronnie, what would you like to say? Yes, hello. Look, this is a, a very tricky question, but I lean to just about towards having a trial, and for the following reason. It's not so much the man who is on trial, it is the nature of the crime. I think back to the, the trial of Adolf Eichmann in, in Jerusalem in 1961. Yes. Obviously, there was a living man behind a glass cage on trial, but far more importantly than the trial of that one man, it was the crime. The crime committed by many people who were no longer alive and of course it gave the victims the opportunity for the first time to air their experiences and most insignificantly it educated the public um if there was a trial oh, and i hate to use the word show trial which mm. evokes sort of stalinist soviet union but 
the purpose of the trial would be to educate and inform and to allow the victims to speak. But it is very, very tricky, and it's, um, well, I'm not utterly convinced by my own position. <laughs> 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 Welcome to my world, Ronnie. It's, uh, not utterly convinced by your own position, and yet you, you, you lean towards the same position that I do. What, though... <sighs> What, though, makes him exceptional? I and mean, you draw a remarkable parallel that, that, that some people yeah, will probably struggle I, I, with. But why, know, why, why don't we put more dead men on trial? Why, why would that... Feel very so look, I don't feel very sorry for his family, who are entirely innocent in this. And, and I don't wish to, to draw any comparison between Eichmann and, and any living person. It's just that there seems, uh, over three decades, to be enough evidence of a horrendous uh, series of crimes cumulatively committed. And therefore, I think, to educate the public about the... the the horror of uh, uh, horrors of paedophilia even if the verdict would be to uh, acquit him at the end nevertheless the the, it, the 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 nature of this crime would have been uh, made very very public yes but you, yes. you can hear the equivocation in my voice. Oh, well, you, I very, can, Ronnie. Very difficult. I can hear the equivocation in your I voice. It is crime, Sorry. The, the crime itself that is on trial, the nature of the crime that is and has been committed by others that is really on trial, rather than this one man who did a lot of good in his life, incidentally, apart from, uh, obviously, the, the, the accusations that have been leveled against him. Of course, and, and you, you mentioned, of course, the, the, the trials of the Nazis. He was himself on the record and quite explicit about there being no circumstances in which frailty, mental or physical, should, should exclude um, anyone accused of war crimes from standing trial. It, it was, of course, he, justice was applied by a different standard to him with regard to his dementia. I, Ronnie's the perfect caller on this, from my point of view, because he, he, he holds the same view I hold, but he holds it with the same caution that I feel. It just feels very odd to sit here and say we should have a trial of the facts involving a dead man. But the question that I'm nudging you towards next is why would having a trial of the facts with a dead man be any different intellectually, philosophically, or even legally from having a trial of the facts with a man whose dementia is so pronounced that he doesn't know what day it is. Well, what's the actual difference between being dead and having dementia in the context of a trial of the facts? Would you allow me to be incredibly arrogant for just one moment? And I'll say, I think if you're drawn towards the notion that this is somehow wrong or incongruous or cruel, then you misunderstand the nature of a trial of the facts. Because a trial of the facts does exactly what it says on the tin, and the facts that will be examined in the court do not change according to whether or not the accused man is incapable of giving evidence because of dementia, or incapable of giving evidence because of death. That's what I need you to pick up. By all means, find, find problems with what I'm saying. But if you want to undermine my position, you need to explain to me why there is a fundamental legal, philosophical, or intellectual difference between being able to give evidence in court due to dementia and being able to give evidence in court due to death. And if you can't pin that down philosophically, intellectually, or legally, I don't think you can oppose the conclusion that if the trial of facts was fit for purpose when he had dementia, then the trial of facts remains fit for purpose even though he's now dead. I've got a couple of phone lines free still, perhaps unsurprisingly, given the incredibly complicated nature or difficult nature of the conversation, but if you want to grab one of them, you can. The number you need is 0345 6060 973. So, two questions. Do you think the trial of facts should go ahead? And if you don't, can you unpick it in a way that actually manages to distinguish between death and dementia as reasons why an accused man can't give evidence in a courtroom? James O'Brien, weekdays 10 till 1 on LBC. 32 minutes after 12. Um, it's the penultimate show of the year for me. Um, some sterling... Uh, swing cover in place for the for the seasonable period. Um, perhaps not to everybody's taste, but hey, give it a chance before you arrive at any negative conclusions. I just want to take 10 seconds, if I may, to thank you for something that's happened in the course of, of this year. It, you started helping me put the show together in a way that never happened before. It's been a really lovely thing for me to, to, to see you sending me articles and emails. Twitter obviously makes this easier, but email as well. That, that, that move on the conversation we're having while we're actually having it. And, and I'm very keen to encourage this as we move into 2016. That is why I've just tweeted an article from the Telegraph, I think yesterday's Telegraph, that was emailed to me by um, Nikki. And it, 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 it 
is relevant to the conversation we're having about Lord Janna. His estate will be scrutinised after mystery ownership swap. This, I think, was prompted by an earlier caller questioning the dementia diagnosis. There's no reason to do that, but this is interesting. Deed to Greville Janna's luxury London flat. The deeds were transferred twice as police and prosecutors prepared a trial over 22 child sex abuse allegations. You can read a little bit more if you follow me on Twitter at Mr. James OB. Conversation we're having is an odd one if you're just tuning in. Here I am telling you that I think a dead man should be put on trial. Why? Well, easily. It's a trial of the facts. A jury gets to decide, having examined the facts, whether or not they think a man was guilty. But that man is not on trial himself because when it was uh, slated to go ahead at the Old Bailey in April, I think, of next year, um, Greville Janner was not in a fit state to answer charges because of dementia. Today he's not in a fit state to answer charges because he's dead. What's the difference? I'm sorry if that sounds brusque, but I think it's an incredibly powerful question. What's the actual difference? By all means, oppose the trial of the facts, period. But if you thought it was okay when he had dementia, how can it not be okay now that he's dead? Amy's in Clapham. Amy, what would you like to say? Hello. Um, I'm really just addressing your initial question, which is um, what the benefit would be yes. of, him, uh, of this trial of facts. And one thing that struck me is that I think as a, it's notorious, cr sexual crimes of this nature are notorious of uh, the victims that suffer of the, uh, through them. Um, find it understandably almost impossible um, to come forward and there's a, a history um, of people being, uh, you know, unable to, to even discuss it with their nearest and dearest, let alone stand up in, in a court and discuss it. Yes. And I think what, what um, this would sort of underline um, society-wide is that this is a crime of a historical nature. The person is deceased. And yet still, this is being handled in a way that takes it, um, you know, completely seriously and recognises the ongoing um, and completely devastating impact so you're, of, you're, of the crime. So you're accommodating the specific nature of Jana's case, it, because it, is, it has gone so far down the road. The trial of the facts has already been approved uh, against the backdrop of the dementia. Exactly. The, nine, the nine accusers have already got legal representation. It's not the same as saying, well, who are we going to dig up next? Exactly. And I just think, you know, if, if you were going to put crimes on a scale, I know that crimes affect people in different ways, but these are so insidious in their, in their nature and in their, on their ongoing impact and uh, for people. And I think that, you know, it's, it's, it sets out a precedent um, to say, this is how we handle these crimes. But yes, it, these are historic. Yes, um, that, you know, this person was unable to physically stand trial and give testament, which obviously is a complication but i think to it's a very strong statement say so this is how seriously we take these yeah. crimes and this is how we're going to handle them from here on in um and it may give confidence to victims in the future to feel they will be ta taken seriously and you know I, I know from listening to even your program that people it takes them years to even pluck up the courage it does um, what do you mean even my program <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not claiming to be an expert on this. And, no, know, but, but we go I, with I, the I testimony we've either. heard, and, and it is through this programme, certainly for me, and, and it would seem for you as well, that we've heard the voices of people who suffered this sort of abuse more loudly and more commonly than ever before in our lives. Certainly that's the case for me. And, and one thing on which almost all of them agree is, is that the, the fear of not being believed makes the crime even more repellent and and of course mikey's been in touch talking about his own family and how they refused to believe him when he was raped by his own brother at the age of nine and and you know the, 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 you're right and mikey proves it just in that text we're not talking today necessarily to people with specific experience of these issues but a lot of them are getting in touch with me via text and email and all of them are saying it is it's about being believed or at least being taken seriously and you have to remember there were three separate occasions in the last 20 years where these nine men had provided enough evidence, had provided enough testimony for the CPS to have concluded that there should have been a case and there wasn't and I want to know why and so do they. I also want to know their stories and so should you because Greville Janna moved in the highest corridors of this country and if he moved with impunity despite perhaps being guilty of what he stands accused of that speaks, as we've spoken before on this program, that speaks of an institutional cancer, 
not just an individual one. Steve's in Ellsbury. Steve, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, um, just looking at it from a, a slightly different viewpoint uh, from you, uh, while in no way I sympathise in any way with Mr. Jenner or what he may or may not have done, sure. um, I just feel that it's very worrying when you can have someone accuse you of something, whether you've got dementia or not, doesn't matter, but um, or whether you're dead doesn't matter, but when you're accused of something, the basic tenet of our society is that you are innocent until it's proven that you're guilty. Yes. And part of that is that you have a right to defend yourself. Um, and if you're dead, of course, or you're well, no, not that, capable, that's, that, that, that's not true of a trial of the facts. You don't, well, the whole point of a trial of the facts is that the court, the jury, the court just examines the facts put forward the, and the jury the decides whether they're, whether they're true or not. There's no right to defend yourself in a trial of the facts. No, but if, if the facts are just the accusations made by individuals, granted there's more than one, and I'm, I'm in no way trying to defend him, but if, if somebody accused you of something and it was stated as a fact, but there was no other evidence to confirm that, Oh, well, then it wouldn't, the jury wouldn't find it guilty. It. Then it wouldn't be beyond reasonable doubt, would it? Well, no, because what you're saying is that the facts will be presented and the facts are the statements of the victims. There's no other facts uh, presented by any defence. Yeah, and if, there, if, there, if those are not persuasive enough, compelling enough, damning enough, then there will not be uh, a beyond reasonable doubt situation and the jury will not... No, but it, if they're facts, it, they're being presented as facts, facts... Oh, true. No, 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 facts no, facts. no, no. I, you, I, I, I understand so the point you're making. I understand the point you're making. It is called a trial of the facts uh, because it is not going to examine, because it doesn't admit a defence. You're absolutely right in terms of the man accused would not be able to defend himself. But this is where I just need to be clear on one thing. This is why you don't think it should have gone ahead even when he had dementia then. I just think it's the basic right of anybody accused of anything to be able to present a defence. Yes, and, and, it, and if, if you can't able, present a defence because of dementia, then the trial shouldn't go ahead at all. Um, difficult one because... No, no, it isn't difficult. You've already answered yes to that question. No. OK, then I would say no, it shouldn't because you have That's fine. I've got no argument with you. I disagree with you, but I'm not going to argue yeah. with you because you don't think that the trial of the facts should have gone ahead even when he had dementia. No, but do you see where this might lead? That, that, you, you know, you're alive and you're well... Um, you're accused of something by somebody, and it's taken as a fact... No, you, 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 you need to trust me on this. I'm going to sound incredibly patronising, but you're getting confused <laughs> about the meaning of the word fact. You still have a requirement for beyond reasonable doubt. So you can stand up in court and say, James O'Brien pinched my marbles, and, and uh, you can say it a million times, it doesn't become true. It only becomes true when you've proved it beyond reasonable doubt. Yeah, but the and that's when a sentence that would be handed down. It's, to be no, mate, stop talking. It's not enough just to stand up and say so. It doesn't. It's not. That's why I say you're confused about what facts mean in this context. It doesn't become a fact the minute they say it in court. It only becomes a conclusion when a jury has determined that something has been proven beyond reasonable doubt. So, however many people say something, and however loudly they say it, and however many people are queuing up to endorse it, the the trial of the facts will examine how plausible that. That claim is and all of the onus of the British justice system is on the side of the accused because it has to be beyond reasonable doubt so they'd have to have proof upon proof upon proof before they delivered a verdict and that should really deal with all your reservations can I say something no <laughs> yeah go on then it's just, <laughs> well, well you're saying that, that you know that they they make their statements and it has to be proven beyond doubt but part of proving that is for that evidence to be tested by a defence. Yeah, uh, up and to it, yes, no, no I, again, I do understand exactly what you're saying, which is why it wouldn't involve a punishment, which is why even if the jury decided that he was guilty, he still wouldn't get punished because of, of his dementia and his inability to offer up a defence, but it wouldn't change the fact of the verdict because uh, what you're saying is, oh, okay, well, someone says that he was in this children's home on the 17th of January, and then he, sh he can prove that he wasn't. Uh, well, A, he doesn't have to be there to do that, you know, you could, you could, his defence could bring a diary, they could bring, you don't have to have the person there. You can be put on trial in this country in absentia. And if you can be put on trial in absentia, you can be put on trial with dementia. And if you can be put on trial with dementia, you can be put on trial even though you're dead. Not a conventional trial, an extraordinary trial, which we happen to call in this country a trial of the facts.
Steve made some good points, though. I, I, I just want to cling to my belief that this trial should go ahead. And perhaps I'm allowing that to cloud my judgment. Ian's on the Isle of Dogs. Ian, what do you think? Well, I think you've got my point, James, or, or my first point already, but it's worth restating because not everyone seems to accept it. It's a trial of the facts. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trial of the facts. It's not a prosecution of a defendant. There Precisely. is, in my suggestion, no difference between this week and last week. Last week, Lord Jenna could not and was not going to be able to contribute evidence or information at the trial. He won't be able to anymore. Uh, that hasn't changed. It's a trial of the facts, which is important also, not just for the victims to state their case, but to, as perhaps you've already stated, to reveal, it is to be hoped, evidence or information about why on at least three occasions Westminster presumably stopped the police from properly investigating. And that's never going to come out unless there's some form of legal process. Well, the other way it might come out, and it seems to me that we, the citizens, have an opportunity, nay, an obligation to monitor these things. The only reason, it seems to me, the DPP changed her initial quasi-judicial decision not to have a trial of the facts was public pressure. Yes. So um, we, um, we need... Sorry. And media. We need to inform ourselves and then lobby, if necessary, to uh, have these things promptly investigated. Otherwise, this will just be another file for the Goddard inquiry, which I have faith in, but it's already under pressure. It's being stalled. And uh, let's at least have one of these. And it's five out. years off delivery. I mean, even even in the best case scenario. So so you, you're right. It just becomes another another kick into the long grass, as it were, despite the fact that the accusers, stroke victims, are still alive and still suffering. Um, Ian, thank you. I, I, there is room, I thought Steve played a very strong hand, there is room to, to dispute the consensus. The consensus at the moment is that the trial of the fact should go ahead even though he's dead. There are a few people expressing some scepticism regarding that original dementia diagnosis of um, Greville Janner. Some of you now are getting in touch with me to, to express a degree of scepticism regarding his actual death, which is certainly pushing the bounds of incredulity a little further than I'm prepared to go. The time is 12.48. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The question is relatively straightforward. Lord Janner is no longer with us. Should the trial of the facts regarding the vicious allegations, uh, vicious by nature, uh, to describe the crimes he is accused of, not, not in any sense the uh, people making the accusations, should it go ahead anyway? I haven't really heard any powerful arguments yet as to why it shouldn't. But there's time. It's 12.48. Connor's in Weston. Connor, what would you like to say? Hi right, James. Um, I just I just thought I'd say about how I think we're looking at it kind of wrong. I think the idea of putting a dead man on trial is a bit trivial because I think the whole idea about if he had dementia, I think it's different because the whole idea of putting someone on trial is so that you can punish them afterwards. I mean, that's the whole idea of the justice system. No, it's not. It's the print is. Well, it's the principle of desert. Yeah, but not 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 in a trial of the facts. There is no principle of desert. Oh, I'll have to, I'll, you'll have to excuse me, but I'm not too um, knowledgeable on this specific court case. It's all right, that's right. No, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not this specific court case. If, if he was still alive and the trial of the facts went ahead and it's an examination of the prosecution facts, that's the thing, and they found that the prosecution case was, was viable, the jury handed down the equivalent of a guilty verdict, he still wouldn't have been punished. Well, as, as well as that, I just, I don't see how it's any... It, I don't really think it's helpful. I mean, a lot of people are saying... No, that oh, doesn't, I don't, it, it doesn't really matter whether you, whether you think it's helpful or not. The nine people who accuse him think it would be. Well, that's, that's fair enough. I hadn't, I hadn't heard that. I, I, I simply assumed that. I thought, he, he's dead. He's kind of got away, gotten away with his crime as such. There's no, there's no real sort of... Um, but he would have, to use your phrase, he would have got away with it even if he hadn't died because of his disease, because by dint of his dementia. Well, that's that. That's where I think the system is 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 slightly flawed. I feel like there should be some sort of difference in the dementia and death. I feel like someone who why, has mate? dementia, how why, horrible Colin? it is. Why? Why do you think there should be a difference? Because because the phrase I've used, and it's a clumsy phrase, I grant you, but it's a I think it's an accurate one. The the notion of being intellectually dead, as 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 in suffering from dementia to such a degree that you're yeah. not even really you anymore, and being actually dead. In terms of the court case, what's the difference? Well, I feel like those who are 
they're still them. Even though they, no, they've them, forgotten them. a lot, they are still them. They're still the same person. We can't we can't say that their personal identity has changed because of this this horrible, horrible deal that they have. Exactly. The, the law I does. Do. The law does. You, you know what power of attorney means. You're no longer allowed to make decisions about your own welfare, your own money, your oh. own estate. You you are not you. You are not there. Oh, of course. You of might, course. You're physically, there's a corporeal presence, but that's just that's just bones. In terms of intellect, in terms of law, and in terms of any sort of meaningful act of agency, you are not there. You are judged not to be there. That's why you have a trial of facts, and that's why you lose power of attorney. Well, that's fair enough. You've you've educated me a lot on this one phone call, I have to say. You're very kind, Connor. You're very kind. 12.51 is... No, oh, go on, have another crack, then. <laughs> I was, no, I was just going to say, I just I do feel that I, that kind of... the It's just trivial, putting a dead man on trial. There's... I, I, I don't see a lot that could come of it. No, I, but, I, but then, then I would once again refer you to the, to the position of, of, of his accusers and their lawyers. And the, 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 the difference, I think, where, where you're kind enough to suggest they educated you, obviously haven't dissuaded you from your original position, but the notion that there's no, that there's no difference between dementia and death is, I think, an impossible one to dismantle. Although there is still time. It's 12.52. You can call 03456060973. Uh, where, where, where do you stop, asks Barton. All, do you try all those accused of a crime if they die before the trial? All need to be heard on, on all crimes. No, I've answered these questions already. You, you don't do anything like that because a trial of the facts has been announced not a trial by jury a trial of the facts of the prosecution so yeah that's they're so rare that you could argue they should go ahead even if the person at the center of the allegations dies before the case reaches court they're so rare you could argue that every trial of the facts should go ahead even if the um even if the accused perishes i could live with that jonathan's in chelsea jonathan what would you like to say Hi, yes. Uh, concerning the trial of the facts, <clears throat> they, they normally have a purpose in terms of determining whether the accused uh, needs to be supervised in some fashion. Um, Not in this <clears throat> case. Uh, well, no, that's what trials of the facts are for. And, of course, now he's dead, there's no, there's no useful conclusion that could possibly be made. Apart from an absolute discharge, that'd be pretty useful, wouldn't it, if you were a member of his family? Well... Uh, if if there's an absolute discharge, well, <clears throat> he, he he has been discharged. He's he's, he's died bef before he could come to trial. Um, it's not answering my uh, question. If it was if it was your dad, you'd probably think an absolute discharge was a, was a, was a, what was the phrase you used? Nothing of use could come from it. That would not be well, true, would it? Well, let's put it like this. Uh, and if you were a victim and a guilty verdict were handed down, albeit that there'd be no hospital order, do you not think as a victim, knowing that you'd been believed, would be to use your word useful? Well, uh, I think that what would be more useful is for the in, is for the evidence to be put before the Goddard inquiry. What evidence? Because the evidence of, of of the victims, whatever evidence there might be that others had heard um, known of Jana's uh, Goddard inquiry uh, with with a remit that covers thirty years involves <laughs> countless other accusers and isn't set to deliver anything remotely resembling a conclusion for the best part of five years. Uh, not so, because uh, mm -hmm. Goddard has stated that uh, Jana will be among the first things that she'll yes, be looking at. and she's at. not going to reveal anything for five years. And secondly, that uh, interim, interim reports will be being produced in the, in, during that five years. Yes. Exactly. Almost everything you've said is, is, is dodging the questions that I'm asking. They're not difficult. Can you have to say now, categorically, that if you were a victim of this sort of abuse, you would not feel it was in any way useful to have a trial of the facts of your abuser? Um, well, let's put it like this. No, it no, no, I just so. said that you're not answering my questions, and then you come straight back with a let's put it like this. Here's the thing, if you'd been abused, would you honestly think it wasn't useful to see a trial of the facts regarding your abuser? Because I don't believe you. Uh, no, I don't think I would. Okay, that's fine. I don't believe you. It's 12.55. Carl's in Orpington. Carl, what would you like to say? Hello, James. I, I think the whole thing that worries me is that um, after a trial of, trial of the facts, um, the, uh, the 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 person that is uh, you know being accused uh, should have a right of appeal like any other kind of appellant, and, and one of the grounds of appeal would be potentially that there that, the, that there are two sets of facts the judge has not considered or given his reasons or accounted for an element of the facts and so that means that person that is accused would have to then instruct solicitors and give them the, uh, the facts that are correct but, but this is an argument against trials of the facts not an argument against doing it to him now he's dead that's an argument well, against all of them well he's he wouldn't have capacity to instruct counsel well he didn't already dispute of facts he didn't already yeah yeah while he was still alive so, 
so so the, tr the, the those are the circumstances the in which you have a trial of the facts yes but the, the the process would be academic then would it not because academic to you not, not, but not academic not to the accusers know. You're not going to know the facts, are you? Because if he can't instruct uh, uh, solicitors... Uh, yes, this is what I'm saying, Carl. You're, 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 you're objecting to the entire practice of a trial of the facts because... Well, it's going to sound awful, because partly you don't understand what it means. Well, well, I mean, or is it that you don't understand it what it means? It could be that I don't understand what it means, yeah, but that would well, mean that well, would be the entire say. British judicial system that has an, well, a, a, an inferior understanding to yours, because you're, you're, well, you're disputing... No, no, Cole, just no, let no, me no. explain, briefly. Uh -huh. yeah. You're disputing well, the efficacy of any trial of the facts. Any trial at all. And that's fine, but the British justice system isn't. Well, no, that you're saying that. I'm saying that uh, any trial of facts or any any conclusions in any adjudicating uh, administration uh, would have an appellant jurisdiction. No, I, I, I heard you. An appellant jurisdiction. I, I heard you. So, so without, if you can't instruct somebody on that appellant jurisdiction, then you wouldn't have a fair trial. Yeah. So there can be no such thing as a fair trial of the facts. This isn't even an argument. This is just 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 saying exactly the same thing. You thinking that it's undesirable, me thinking it's desirable. You have a trial of the facts when you can't instruct counsel. That's why it's a trial of the facts and not a trial. He couldn't instruct counsel when he had dementia and he can't instruct counsel when he's dead. I don't see a meaningful difference between the two and nor do you. You just don't think you should ever have a trial of the facts. So if someone refuses to turn up in court, you can't put them on trial. It's a ludicrous position to adopt. Right, well you're on trial for murder, I'm not coming. Oh, alright, then we'll call the trial off. Because you can't, you can't instruct counsel. I'm refusing to instruct counsel. Right, we'll call the trial off. It's not going to happen. Charlotte's in Windsor. Charlotte, what would you like to say? Hi, yeah, I just want to count to um, question one of the questions you originally asked, which was, Blimey. if you have outside, if you have Alzheimer's, and if you're dead, what's the difference? Yes. But the question I want to ask is, what classifies you as a person on trial? Is it your mind or is it your body? Your mind. Because, but it, but it could be your body as well. No, it's mens rea, is the Latin phrase. And mens is the Latin word for mind. But if. Your, if it is your mind, though, then this guy couldn't be on trial if he had Alzheimer's. Correct, and he wouldn't have been. It was a trial of the facts, not a trial of the man. So it was always a trial of the, ma um, of the facts? Yep. Why has it been delayed for so long? Pardon? Why has it been delayed for so long? We won't know until we have a trial of the facts. Okay, then. Fair point. And that, I think, is the final bowl of the innings. It's coming up to 12.59. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. My apologies to Mark and, and to a few other people waiting to contribute. Go and read the Dan Hodges article in The Telegraph and then let me know whether you find it as, uh, as unpleasant as I do. And I speak as someone who, who both likes and admires Dan Hodges as a person and often as a journalist. But this phrase is coined. It's like a sort of intellectual version of Richard Littlejohn. Paedophilia psychosis. Paedophile psychosis. I, I would argue, in answer to his question, that if you're going after people like that you can never actually go too far or try too hard.